In this module, we will discuss steady state error. In the previous module, we began to discuss how to design controllers. In particular, we designed our controllers in order to achieve a certain transient response. In this module, we will discuss how to achieve a certain steady state response. In particular, how to achieve a certain level of steady state error. So here we have a typical output response for a dynamic system. And so far in the course, we've learned that the transient response of a system is dictated by the location of its poles and zeros. Where the transient response is sort of when the system's response is changing and the location of the poles and zeros define aspects of this transient behavior, things like overshoot, settle time, and peak time. It's also important, however, to achieve a certain steady state behavior. So in this example where the input is a constant, the steady state behavior is defined by the final value reached by the, by the system's response. And so we know that we can determine the final value of a system's response employing the final value theorem. In particular, y steady state is equal to the limit as s approaches 0 of s times y of s, where y is the output. And so in addition to achieving a certain transient response, we also want to achieve a certain steady state response, in particular, to achieve a certain limit on the steady state error. We've actually already calculated steady state error in some previous modules and previous examples. And the way that we did that was simply to apply the final value theorem. E steady state is equal to the limit as s approaches 0 of s times e of s, where e of s is the difference between, in essence, the command and the output. So we have some reference r, which is our desired output, and we compare it to the actual output, and the difference between those two is the error. In some previous examples, it's turned out that this signal was equal to the error. That's not true in general. In particular, it's not true because h of s actually modifies the output. So this signal isn't actually r minus y. It's r minus, in essence, a measurement of y. And so if h of s has dynamics or h of s has a steady state value that's not equal to 1, then this signal will be distorted and it won't be the true error. That's OK, though, because we can still calculate what the true error is. In particular, we can calculate what y of s is by employing what we know about block diagrams. In particular, the transfer function for this negative feedback system can be reduced using the rule forward over 1 plus loop, where the forward path is g divided by 1 plus loop, where the feedback path is g times h. And so in order to calculate the output y of s, we simply take our transfer function and multiply r of s to the right-hand side. Substituting that in for y of s, we get an expression for e of s. One thing that we have to be a little bit careful of here when we're trying to determine the final value of the error is that in some cases the reference input could be going to infinity. For example, if our reference was a ramp. And so there we would have a situation where the reference is growing to infinity and the output could also be growing to infinity. And so when we take the limit, this term blows up and this term blows up. And to say infinity minus infinity doesn't really mean anything. It's what we call an indeterminate form. So these two could be both going to infinity, but the limit of the error could be 0, it could be infinity, or it could be some finite value. What really matters is the relative rates at which these two quantities go to infinity. So you could imagine a situation where you know, r is a ramp, and maybe y is growing to infinity, but it's growing to infinity at a different rate. And so the difference between the two, the error, 
is getting larger and larger and larger. But you could have a different situation where they grow at the same rate or where they even approach one another. So in order to be able to take this limit, keeping in mind this indeterminate form, in essence we need to get a common denominator between these two. And so the denominator of this term is 1 over g times h. And so if we imagine that there's a constant 1 multiplying this r, we can imagine it as 1 plus gh divided by 1 plus gh. Now we have a common denominator, and we can combine the two. So we have a denominator of 1 plus g h this common factor r. And here we have a numerator of 1 plus gh subtracting a numerator of g. And so if we rearrange e of s into this form, we can take the limit as s goes to 0, and we can get a conclusive understanding of the steady state error. At this point, we'll now go ahead and find the steady state error for this simple example where we're using a P controller. So we recall that error is simply the difference between the reference or the desired output and the actual output. R of S we know because it's given to be a unit step and Y of S we can find an expression for by recognizing this as a negative feedback structure. Specifically we can find the closed loop transfer function g of s, where y of s is the output and r of s is the input. And since this is a negative feedback system, we can use the rule forward divided by 1 plus loop. In this case, the forward path is kp times the plant 2 divided by the quantity s plus 1. So that becomes our numerator. And then our denominator is 1 plus loop, where the loop includes the controller kp, the plant, and this element in the feedback path. And so the product of those three, where 2 times 5 is 10, gives us 10 times kp divided by the quantity s plus 1 times the quantity s plus 5. We then usually like to clean this up so that we have a transfer function that's a single polynomial divided by a single polynomial. So in order to achieve that, we can multiply through on the top and the bottom by this denominator in order to clear out the fractions. When we take this quantity and multiply it by the numerator, the s plus 1 quantities will cancel. We'll be left with 2 times kp times the quantity s plus 5. When we multiply this quantity through the denominator, we distribute it to the 1. So that'll just be s plus 1 times s plus 5. And then when we multiply by this term, it'll cancel the denominator and we'll just be left with 10 kp. So this is an expression for the closed loop transfer function. Based on this, we can get an expression for y of s where we simply take r of s and multiply it to the right hand side. So the output y of s is equal to the transfer function times the input r of s. We can then substitute that in for y of s. So we have r of s, we sub in here, where y of s is equal to the closed loop transfer function multiplied by r of s. Now we have an expression for e of s, the error in the Laplace domain. And once we have that, we can calculate the steady state error using the final value theorem. Specifically, e steady state is equal to the limit as s approaches 0 of s times e of s. Substituting in 
you have s times e of s, which is this entire expression. We can just go ahead and set this straight in. Previously, I had mentioned how if we had a situation where the reference was growing to infinity and the output was growing to infinity, we end up with an indeterminate form where it doesn't make any sense to talk about something going to infinity minus something else going to infinity. And in that case, we needed to get a common denominator between these two terms before we could take the limit. In this case, r is a unit step, so that will be finite and the output will be finite, so we don't necessarily have to find a common denominator if we don't want to. So I'm going to just take this expression and insert it straight away without, without finding the common denominator. Looking at this, both terms have a common factor of r of s, so I'm going to factor out that r of s, where r of s is equal to 1 over s, because it's a unit step. When I factor away the r of s from this term, I'm left with a 1. When I factor the r of s away from this term, I'm left with g of s in essence, 2 times kp times the quantity s plus 5 divided by the quantity s plus 1 times the quantity s plus 5 plus 10 kp. If I want to evaluate this integral, that s will cancel from the, with the s from the reference. And this remaining function is defined at s equals 0. So I can simply sub in for s equals 0. In particular, this first term is just a constant, so it remains. In the numerator, as I take s to 0, I'm just left with 5. 2kp times 5 is 10kp. And the denominator, I'll have 0 plus 1 times 0 plus 5. That's 5 plus 10 kp. So this gives us an expression for the steady state error. And if we choose a value for our proportional gain kp, we can just substitute it in to calculate the exact steady state error. To get a better sense of how the steady state error is affected by kp, I'm going to go ahead and rearrange this by getting a common denominator. In particular, I want a denominator of 5 plus 10 times kp. So 1, I can think of as simply 5 plus 10 kp divided by 5 plus 10 kp. Since these two terms have the same common denominator, I can combine them. So on the one side, I'll have 5 plus 10 kp. On the other side, I'll have minus 10 kp. That 10 kp cancels that 10 kp. I'm left with 5 divided by 5 plus 10 kp. So that's the, an alternative form of the steady state error. Looking at this, you can see that this is always non-zero. So no matter, in essence, our choice of kp, we can't get the steady state error to zero. As we make kp larger, this quantity in the denominator will become larger. This quantity in the numerator stays the same. So we have a finite number divided by a number that's, that's going to infinity. And so the total will approach 0. So this shows that by increasing kp, we can reduce the steady state error. Um, in practice, there will usually be a limit on how large we can make kp because it will adversely affect the transient response. You know, It will cause more overshoot. Things like that um, may hurt the settling time. And so we can't just arbitrarily get uh, the steady state error we desire. One option for reducing the steady state error is to add a precompensator. We'll go ahead and call it P. So let's imagine that we've 
designed our proportional controller to give us the transient response we desire peak time, settling time, overshoot, etc. And so we look at the response. We have the sort of shape we desire, the transient response characteristics we desire. But let's say we don't have the steady state response we desire. So we commanded a reference of one, but let's say that our output approaches two in steady state. So we have the right overshoot and settling time, etc., but we don't have the right steady state error. So one option is simply to take this precompensator and use it to scale the output. So take a second and think about what P should be equal to in order to give us the desired steady state output. So simply you can see if we chose P to equal 0 0.5 then we would have the exact same shape of our output but everything would just be half as large. So it would be the same shape but it would be scaled down. And this way we would have the same settling time, we would have the same peak time, we'd have the same overshoot when considered as a percentage, and we would have the output that we desire, the steady state output that we desire. Can you think of any limitations of this approach? It seems almost too good to be true. We can design KP to give us the transient response we desire, and then we can simply add this precompensator to give us the steady state error we desire. So take a second and think about what might be a drawback of this approach. It turns out that a drawback of this approach is that it's not very robust. You know, this 0 0.5 was predicted or chosen based on our application of the final value theorem using this model of the plant and this model of the sensor. It turns out if our model is incorrect, the plant doesn't actually behave like this, the sensor doesn't actually behave like this, then our scaling will be incorrect. You know, if these, if our model is wrong such that our output isn't actually 2, let's say it was 1.5, then when we apply our scaling, it will actually shift or it could shift the final value away from what's desired. So if it turned out to be actually 1.5 and we scaled it by 0.5, then we would have shrunk it too much. We'd be getting a steady state output of 0.75 instead of 1. Similarly, if we have a situation where we have some unknown disturbance entering our system, this precompensator also doesn't account for that. So even if we have perfect knowledge of our model, this disturbance will cause us to shift away from the desired steady state value. An alternative to the precompensator as a means for reducing the steady state error is to use a PI controller. So here we have the exact same system from before except now with a PI controller. So we'll go ahead and follow the exact same process and find the steady state error of the system in this situation. So again we define error as the difference between the reference i.e. the commanded output and the actual output. R of s in this case is simply 1 over s because we have a unit step input. Y of s we can get an expression for from the closed loop transfer function which we will call g of s which has an output of y of s and an input of r of s. It's a negative feedback structure so we can use our rule forward over 1 plus loop before we do that, however, I want to go ahead and rewrite this so that it has a common denominator of s. This term has a denominator of s. In order to get this term to have a denominator of s, we multiply and divide by s.
Now we can combine them, where the numerator of the first term is s times kp, and the numerator of the second term is simply ki. So once we've done that, we can see that our forward path includes the pi controller in the plant. So it's equal to 2 times the quantity kps plus ki divided by s. That's the numerator of our transfer function. The denominator has the form 1 plus loop, where the loop includes these three transfer functions, the controller, the plant, and the sensor. Recognizing that 2 times 5 is 10, we have 10 times the quantity kps plus ki divided by s times the quantity s plus 1 times the quantity s plus 5. We then would like to clean this up, get it into the form of a single polynomial divided by a single polynomial. In order to do that, we, mul we can multiply through by this denominator. No, I left off an s plus 1 here in the forward path. So in order to clean this up, we can multiply through by this quantity. When we multiply that through the numerator, the s will cancel, the s plus 1 will cancel, be left with 2 times the quantity kps plus ki and s plus 5. When we multiply through the denominator, this quantity will multiply 1 and then when we multiply this term, the quantity will cancel that denominator and we'll just be left with 10 times kps plus ki. So this is our closed loop transfer function. We can then use this to substitute in for y of s, where y of s is simply the closed loop transfer function times the input r of s. So substituting in, we have r of s minus y of s, where y of s again is equal to that whole big transfer function up there. is multiplied by r of s. So that gives us our expression for e of s. Previously we had shown that since our unit step is a finite value our reference doesn't blow up and our output doesn't blow up so we don't have an indeterminate form and we can simply employ this in the final value theorem. Just as an exercise I'm going to go ahead and, and attempt to find a common denominator um, in the case that we had a situation with, for example, a ramp input where the reference and the output were growing unbounded. So I'll take this R of S and I'll factor it out because there's an R of S in each of the two terms. And then I want to combine the two terms so that they have this common denominator, s times the quantity s plus 1 times the quantity s plus 5 plus 10 times the quantity kps plus ki. In order to make this first term, which is just a 1, once I factor out the r of s, in order to make this 1 have the denominator I desire, it'll basically have that denominator with an equal numerator. So up here, I'll get that exact same expression. And then I will subtract the numerator of this other term, which is already there. When I do that, I'm going to go ahead and distribute these terms across the s plus 5. So I'll end up with a first term that's 2 times kps plus ki times s. And then when I do that for the second term, I'll have 2 times 5 
so this is the numerator from the first term which is just equal to 1 and this is the numerator off the second term where I'm subtracting the entire quantity and so what you'll notice is this term matches that term and so when I subtract they simply cancel each other out so that's just an example of how we find a common denominator if it's necessary to once we have that we can then go ahead and apply the final value theorem where I can use that entire expression for E of s So E of s is equal to R of s, in this case where R of s is simply a unit step, 1 over s. In the numerator, I have this quantity s times the quantity s plus 1 times the quantity s plus 5, and then it subtracts this other quantity 2 times kps plus ki. denominator is the same as it was. Okay. Looking at this limit, we have the s from the final value theorem, the s and the denominator from the unit step reference, they cancel. If I go further, I left off this S, so I'll include that. If we look at that, this function is defined at S equals 0, so we can simply sub in. This term has a 0 multiplying this whole thing, so that will be 0. This term has a 0 multiplying the whole thing, so the whole numerator is 0. And the denominator, this term will go to 0, because we have an S multiplying this term will go to 0 and we'll be left with 10 times ki in the denominator. So 0 is equal to 10 times ki which is equal to 0. And so what we've shown is by adding the integral action to our controller we've been able to make the steady state error go to 0. And interestingly enough the steady state error goes to zero no matter what the value of ki. Even for a small value of ki, the steady state error would go to zero. The idea, however, is that if we used a very small value of ki, it would likely take a long time to drive the error to zero. Um, so the ki doesn't affect the final value, but it does affect the rate at which we get there. We will now introduce some terminology that will allow us to assess the steady state error of a system at a glance, as opposed to having to necessarily apply the final value theorem. So in the previous example, we saw that adding integral control and enabled our plan to track a step input with zero steady state error. And this trend or effect in, is true in general. Uh, the presence of pure integrators holes at the origin tend to reduce the steady state error to all types of inputs, steps, ramps, etc. The number of integrators is identified by something called a systems type. So more specifically, um, this is the definition of system type. The number of poles at the origin and the forward path of a unity feedback control system is called the systems type. So in particular, it must be a unity feedback system that has this sort of structure. And it doesn't matter if these poles are, are in the controller or the plant. So it doesn't matter if we added the integrator with a PI controller or if the plant itself already had an integrator in it. But for the above structure where we have the product of the controller and the plant, this is an example transfer function where it has s to the n, s to the n power in the denominator. In other words, it has n poles at the origin. 
with value equal to zero. So we define this to be a type N system. Let's look at a few examples. So let's say we have a transfer function of that form. So looking at this, it has a pole at minus four, but it has no poles at the origin. It has no poles s equal to zero. It has no integrators. So we define this to be type a type zero system. Let's look at another example. So in this case, we have a single pole at the origin or a single integrator. You know, it has this form where n is 1. So it has s to the 1 power. So we define this to be a type 1 system. And if we go one step further, here we have two poles at the origin. Here n is equal to 2. And so this is called a type 2 system under the conditions that it's in a unity feedback structure such as this. So in the first example we did in this, in this module, we didn't, strictly speaking, have a unity feedback system because we had some dynamics in the feedback path. But it ended up that this term didn't affect the final value because it had a, a DC gain equal to 1. So let's hypothetically say we had this the same system but with a 1 replacing it. That system is a type 0 system because it didn't have any integrators in the controller or the plant. And we saw that when we solved for the steady state error that it was non-zero. It was some uh, non-zero value. We then added an integrator to the controller in the second part of the example such that the system became a type 1 system again if we had a 1 in the unity feedback path and we saw that it was able to track a step with zero steady state error. It turns out it would not be able to track a ramp with, with zero steady state error however. But if we added a second integrator so it said it was a type 2 system then it would be able to track a ramp. So this can track a step with zero steady state error. And this can track a ramp with zero steady state error. One way to try and remember this is um, is the fact that this, what, what we're observing here, is a special case of something called the internal model principle. What the internal model principle, in essence, says is, if we have a unity feedback system like this, where the forward path includes a copy of the reference, then the system can track that reference with zero steady state error. So in this case, a type 1 system, in essence, has a copy of a step in it. And a type 2 system, in essence, has a copy of a ramp in it. So since a type 1 system includes a copy of a step, it can track a step with zero steady state error. And since a type 2 system has a copy of a ramp in it, it can track a ramp with zero steady state error. On the next slide, we have a, a table summarizing some of these facts. So considering the structure that we had on the previous slide of a unity feedback system, uh, this table summarizes what the steady state error is for different types, for dis different system types, type 0, type 1, and type 2, and for different types of inputs, a step input, a ramp input, and then in essence a parabolic type input. So we recall from our earlier discussion that a type 0 system cannot track a step input with zero steady state error. It tracks it with some non-zero error. So we end up you know, with a picture like this.
with some steady state error. If we add an integrator to the system, then we have a copy of a step input in our forward path. And according to the internal model principle, that means that we can track that input with zero steady state error. So now, the steady state value of the response approaches the commanded reference, the step, the step reference. If we have a type 2 system, a type 2 system has two integrators in it. So in essence, it also has a copy of a step input. It has, in fact, two copies of, a st of the step. So it, too, can track a step input with zero steady state error. If we go to a faster changing input, like a ramp, then a type 0 system can't track a ramp input at all. So if we have a ramp reference, the type 0 system will also grow to infinity, but it'll grow to infinity at a different rate. And so as time goes on, the error, the difference between the commanded reference and the actual output will grow and grow and grow. A type 1 system doesn't have an exact copy of the ramp, so it too cannot track the ramp perfectly, but, but it at least has a finite error. So in this case, if the reference is a ramp, the type 1 system won't exactly equal the reference but it'll grow at the same rate eventually, such that the error reaches some finite non-zero value. A type 2 system, however, does have a copy of a ramp built into it. If you recall, a ramp, the Laplace transform of a ramp, is 1 over s squared. And so it will be able to track, track a ramp with zero steady state error. An acceleration input its Laplace transform continues this trend. It's 1 over s cubed. And so the type 0 system, the error will go to infinity. A type 1 system, the error will go to infinity. But the type 2 system can track it with some amount of finite error. And this trend continues. In essence, the faster the input is changing, the larger the error will be, the harder it is to track. So going even further, while keeping the unity feedback structure of the previous slide, but then rearranging our forward path into this form where we factored out a constant k such that the constant term in the polynomial of the numerator and the constant term in the polynomial of the denominator is equal to 1, then we can go even further um, and redraw this, the table from the previous slide, but instead of just simply saying that the error is non-zero for a type 0 system tracking a, a step, or a type 1 system tracking a ramp, or a type 2 system tracking a acceleration input, we can more specifically define how large that steady state error is in terms of the gain k. This case of a type 0 system tracking a, a step, we saw that the steady state error in the very first example had a form like this, where it was a constant divided by a constant plus k. This k um, is also called the static position error constant. Similarly, if we took a type 1 system, like the second example, but instead of feeding it a step, we fed it a ramp, we would see that the steady state error had this form, where in that case, the k is given a special name of the static velocity error constant. And for an acceleration input, it's called the static acceleration error constant. And so this table and the one preceding it, in essence, give us a shortcut for determining the steady state error of a system. This is a handy thing um, if you, for example, have the standard form of a unity feedback system and you rearrange the forward path to have this structure.
Um, it's a very simple way to estimate the steady state error without having to explicitly find an expression for E of S without explicitly needing to take the, the limit as S goes to zero. But if you don't have this special structure, you can always fall back to the to the final value theorem. If you have something on the feedback path, if you're trying to determine the steady state error in response to an input that enters in a different location than the reference, for example, if you're trying to find the steady state error due to a disturbance or due to noise, then you can't necessarily use this table, um, but you can still employ the final value theorem. So this brings us to the conclusion of module 16. In this module, we demonstrated how steady state error can be calculated employing the final value theorem. We also demonstrated how adding integrators to either the controller or the plant tends to help reduce steady state error. And finally, we introduced a definition, the definition of system type, which can be used as a shortcut for determining steady state error, but can only be used if the system has the specific structure defined. That is, if it's a unity feedback system.